dreaming. I want to begin by showing you a most remarkable photograph taken on April the 23rd by Dr. Ed Kukasha in Brazil. And this shows the planets Venus and Jupiter being occulted by the moon at the same time. That's not happened for over 1,500 years and won't happen for another 1,000 years in the future. It's a missing waking photograph. Meanwhile, at Cerro Paranel in northern Chile, the first 8.2 meter mirror of the VLT, or Very Large Telescope, is now in place and we've had first light. And there is the core of the globular cluster M4. And those star images are truly superb. Do you remember Soho, the solar satellite? Well, let's send back now a picture of a sunquake, a huge storm on the sun, triggered off by a solar flare. And there we have a wave, miles high, spreading out at a quarter of a million miles an hour. Uh, certainly, the sun is a very violent place. And now, on to our main theme. This picture, just been received from the Hubble Space Telescope, and it may be very important. We see there a binary system, and that blob to the lower left may be a planet sent out from that system and now traveling away from it. And if that's so, that will be the first real identification of a planet beyond our solar system. But after all, why shouldn't other stars have planets? Our sun is an ordinary star, one of a hundred, thousand million in our galaxy alone. And we are fairly sure the planets were formed from a cloud of gas and dust around the sun about oh, four and a half thousand million years ago. And what can happen to our sun could also happen to other stars. Um, I'm not talking here about pulsars, human events. Uh, frankly, planets that I think are very unlikely. I'm talking about possible planets of ordinary stars like the Sun. At this stage, welcome back to Dr. Jim Mason. John, there are all kinds of theories about planet formation. What is the current state of play? Well, we believe that our Sun was formed when a, a huge cloud of dust and gas collapsed under the effect of its own gravity. Uh, the centre part collapsed to form the proto-Sun, but there was enough residual angular momentum to stop all the material spiralling into the young Sun, and that material eventually formed into a flattened disk slowly rotating around the proto-Sun, in much the same way as when a chef tosses up a lump of pizza dough and twirls it, it will eventually settle into a flattened disk. Now in the disk, the solid particles settled into the equatorial plane of the sun, they began to clump together, the dust grains formed into pebbles, boulders, small planetesimals, and eventually into protoplanets. The inner four planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars, they probably formed in around about 10 million years. The, the outer gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune, their rocky cores formed first, probably very quickly, in maybe 100,000 years or so, and then uh, gas and ices collected onto those cores, in the case of Jupiter and Saturn, forming in one to two million years, in the case of Uranus and Neptune, rather longer. Well, fascinating disks around other stars have been reported now ever since the, the late 1970s. Yes, that's true. And of course, in 1983, the infrared astronomical satellite IRAS discovered dusty disks around a number of stars, including Vega and Beta Pictoris. Here we can see a visible light picture of the star Vega, and here it is in the infrared, and the disk shows up rather clearly. And that's because these dusty disks scatter infrared radiation very effectively. The following year, the disk around Beta Pictoris was imaged by the 2.5 metre telescope at the Las Campanas Observatory in Chile. Later, the Hubble Space Telescope was able to obtain actual images of protoplanetary disks around other stars. They turn out to be quite common around young stars in starburst regions like the Orion Nebula, for example. And in this sequence, as we zoom in to the centre of the Orion Nebula, in this sequence of Hubble images, we can see actual protoplanetary disks silhouetted there against the brighter glowing gas behind. And they are some two to eight times the size of our own solar system. And if we look at one of those disks face on, we can see the glow from the young star in there uh, just faintly visible. And our Hubble Space Telescope also showed us a better view of the disk around Beta Pictoris and it showed that the disk was slightly warped, and you can see that by the warping of the colour contours there, and that warping may be due to an unseen companion. And if we look in more detail at the disks in the Orion Nebula, again imaged by the Hubble Space Telescope, here we can see a disk edge on, and the central star is not very easily visible, but its light is scattered by dust above and below the plane. 
and those disks turn out to be fairly thin in the central regions, about the size of our solar system. They then flare gently over several hundreds of Earth-Sun distances and are sharply truncated at their outer edge. Quite a number of these protoplanetary disks have been found by now. Yes, indeed. We've had some exciting observations recently. For example, we've got new observations from the Hubble Space Telescope of the disk around Beta Pictoris. Here's a wide-angle view showing the full extent of the disk, which is 220,000 million kilometres across. That's 1,500 times the Earth-Sun distance. And if we look close in to the inner part of the disk, we can see that warp in the disk much more clearly, again indicating the presence of perhaps one or two planets there. And we've also got new observations from the 10-metre Keck telescope on Hawaii, notably from the Merlin infrared camera. And here we can see an image of a disk of dust around the star HR4796 in Centaurus. And it appears that the central part of that disk has been cleared out. And you can see that in this computer model. Now in this animation we can see why that might happen. As the planets are forming out of the dust and gas in the disk, they sweep up the available material, eventually forming a clearing in the middle of the disk. And that's what we appear to have in this case. We've also got some interesting observations from the James Clark Maxwell Telescope, also on Hawaii, in sub-millimetre wavelengths using the SCUBA camera. And here we see an image of the dust disk around the star Fomalo. The star is the position of the little black star at the centre, and the dusty disk is shown by the coloured contours. The one around Fomalo appears to be donut-shaped, with a hole in the centre about the size of our own solar system, possibly produced by planets forming. And here's the disk around Beta Pictoris again, shown from Scuba. And you can see the disk located around the star there, orientated much the same as the Hubble telescope images. But there's a surprise blob to the lower right, some 80,000 million kilometres from the star, and that may be a companion in a dusty shroud. And finally, we have a Scuba image of Vega, the dusty cloud is again symmetrically around Vega, but there's another intense concentration of dust, about 11,000 million kilometres from Vega, shown by the white spot here, and that may be a giant planet in a dusty cocoon. Could well be. And of course, in searching for extrasolar planets, there are various methods we can use. Yes, and one of those techniques has been particularly successful in the last three years. It involves detecting the wobble produced on a star by an unseen planet going round it. If you have a planet going round a star, their mutual gravitational attraction will make the star execute a very small ellipse or circle, which is actually a miniature version of the orbit of the planet around that star. And we can detect the wobbles of the star using the Doppler effect. If the star wobbles away from the Earth, then the light of its spectrum will be shifted towards the red. And if the star wobbles towards the Earth, then the light of its spectrum will be shifted towards the blue. And by looking at this wobble in the spectrum, we can determine whether there's something perturbing the star. Now, what we do is we pass the starlight through a chamber containing iodine vapour, this absorbs certain specific wavelengths and imposes a sort of reference set of lines which are like the tick marks on a ruler against which we can measure the very small shifts in the uh, spectrum of the star. Remember, we're looking for velocities of approach or recession which are about three metres per second. That's slow jogging pace. Not very much. Well, what have we so far learned from this method? Well, nine possible extrasolar planets have been discovered so far. The first was found around the star 51 Pegasi, and we can see here the Doppler velocity curve for 51 Peg, varying smoothly up and down in a period of 4.23 days. And here's another example, around the star HR5185, also known as Tor Bootis. Again, a smooth variation up and down, this time in 3.31 days. And if those variations were perfectly sinusoidal, it would tell us that the planet was going around the star in a perfectly circular orbit. So certainly the objects going around 51 Peg and Tor Bu must be in pretty nearly circular orbits. But we can also, of course, determine uh, the orbits of objects going around in elliptical yes. orbits, because there the variation will not be nearly sinusoidal. Take the case of 70 Virginis, for example. There's the Doppler velocity curve. There's something orbiting that in a period of 117 days, but the orbit is clearly elliptical. 
and a much more extreme example, an object going around 16 Cygni b in 797 days. There's a very elliptical orbit there indeed. And these shifts can tell us something more. They can also tell us the orbital periods of the planets concerned. Yes, this was discovered, of course, by Johannes Kepler way back yes. in the 17th century, that the orbital period of a planet around its star is linked to its average distance from the star. The square of the orbital periods is proportional to the cube of the average distances. And using this law, and knowing the orbital periods determined from the Doppler curves, we can work out the average distances of those planets from their stars. Here we see a diagram summarising the nine possible extrasolar planets. And we can see them there with their distances to scale from their parent stars. There's our own solar system to scale at the top. And at the bottom we have a scale 0, 1, 2 in terms of the Earth's distance from the Sun. We can also use the Doppler curves to tell us about the minimum mass of the extrasolar planets. Because the greater the mass, the greater the wobble, the greater the Doppler shift we observe. Now we can only determine the minimum mass because we have a bit of a problem. We don't know the inclination of the orbit of the extrasolar planet to our line of sight. If the orbit is not inclined at all, then all of the Doppler wobble that we see is due to the mass of the planet and we determine the mass correctly. But if the orbit is inclined to our line of sight, the wobble we see is less than it should be and we will determine a smaller mass than the true mass and so we can only ever determine the minimum masses of the extrasolar planets. They might be a factor of two larger than what we determine. Now using that information, we can look at our nine planets again and we can add the masses for them. We see they vary between 0.5 Jupiter masses, that's MJ, and 10 Jupiter masses. So they're clearly all uh, very large planets. I mean, mind you, maybe there are smaller planets that we're missing because our technique is not sensitive enough at the moment. You know, one thing does worry me, and worries me badly. Some of these planets appear to be strangely close to their parent stars. Yes, these are the members of the so-called 51 Pegasi group. There are five planets of that kind altogether, and they're highlighted here. And you can see they range between 0.5 and 3.8 Jupiter masses, so they're all giant planets. They're all in circular orbits, and they're orbiting very close to their parent stars indeed, less than one quarter of the Earth-Sun distance, and much closer than the planet Mercury is from the Sun. We really didn't expect to find giant planets so close into their parent stars, uh, and we don't really know how they got there. Maybe they formed out of rocky materials close in, or maybe they formed out of icy materials further out and somehow migrated inwards. The heading suggests that these changes are due not to planets at all, but to effects going on in the stars themselves. What do you think about that? Well, this has been looked at very carefully. The possibility that what we're seeing is the effect of stellar oscillations. For example, if you look at the way this balloon oscillates and wobbles when I squeeze it, this is an example of an oscillating system, and there are many different periods of oscillation, not just one. We know that our own Sun oscillates in this way. The SOHO spacecraft, for example, yeah. discovered that the Sun is oscillating, many, many different frequencies of oscillation, and we can see that in these animations here. The problem is that for the possible extrasolar planets, we find just one frequency of oscillation, not many. In addition, we'd expect the shape of the spectral lines to be varying, and they're not. So it seems as though the stellar oscillation theory can't work, and we must look for some other explanation, and extrasolar planets is a good one. Yes, point taken. Then, what do you think about the extrasolar planets with very eccentric orbits? Well, there are three of these. We've already looked at two of them already. Uh, the planet going around 70 Virginis uh, is clearly in a very eccentric orbit with an eccentricity of about 0.4, and that round the 16 Cygni b, even more eccentric, with an eccentricity of 0.57. And there is a third example, the object going around HD 114762, which has an eccentricity of 0.34. The most extreme example, I suppose, is that of 16 Cygni b. Uh, you can see the orbit there, uh, and if we superimpose the inner part of our own solar system, you can see just how eccentric that orbit is, particularly when you bear in mind that Mercury and Pluto, the planets of our own system with the most eccentric orbits, have eccentricities only of about 0.2. And it's really rather difficult to understand how planets could end up in such eccentric orbits, and it's no doubt going to send the theorists scurrying back to their drawing boards. I think it probably is. Then one more thing, too. Um, two of these planets, anyway, appear to be far more massive than Jupiter, our most massive planet. Could they, therefore, be 
Not planets at all, but brown dwarf stars. That's a distinct possibility. If we look at the two bodies concerned, the objects going around 70 Virginis and HD 114762, they have masses of 6.6 .6 and 10 Jupiter masses respectively. Now a brown dwarf is really a failed star, a star which isn't massive enough for nuclear reactions to have begun in its core, and we believe that that will happen if the mass is less than 80 Jupiter masses. The first definite example of a brown dwarf was photographed by the Hubble Space Telescope, that small blob, an object going around the star Gliese 229, and that has a mass of between 20 and 50 Jupiter massives. Now, the most massive planets that we know of are 10 Jupiter masses, so clearly the objects going around 70 Virginis and HD 114762 have masses at the lower end of the brown dwarf scale, but the higher end of the planet scale. Yes, it's interesting too that none of these planets so far identified seem to be much like the planets in our own solar system. No, there's really only one that resembles our own system, and that's the planet going around the star 47 Ursae Majoris. Uh, we can see here the Doppler curve for that star. Um, the uh, curve is varying in a period of 1,094 days. That's about three Earth years. Very smoothly, so it's in a circular orbit. And the mass of the object is about 2.4 Jupiter masses. And if this was in our own solar system, it would be a bit like Jupiter's big brother, a <laughs> massive planet orbiting on the inner edge of the asteroid belt. Assuming that these planets really exist, what do you think of the chances of life there? Well, for any star, we can define what we call the habitable zone, which is the region around the star within which an Earth-sized planet could support liquid water on its surface. Now, for our own solar system, that extends from just inside the Earth's orbit to just outside the Earth's orbit. But for none of the extrasolar planets discovered so far, do they orbit continuously within that habitable zone. So I think the chances of life are very slim. What do you think is going to come next? Well, we need to find out if the extrasolar planets we've discovered so far are really typical. And that means extending our Doppler surveys to many more hundreds of stars uh, using observatories and telescopes around the world, including the 9.2-metre Hobby Eberly Telescope in Texas. Eventually, too, the two 10-metre Keck telescopes on Hawaii will be linked together to form an optical interferometer equivalent to a single telescope 85 metres across, and that will be able to show planets much smaller than the current Jupiter-sized bodies. And within five years, the four telescopes of the Very Large Telescope in Chile will also be interconnected as an interferometer, and they may well be able to detect the effects of Earth-sized planets. NASA, too, is planning to launch a number of spacecraft to look for extrasolar planets, and one of these, Planet Finder, may actually be able to image Earth-sized planets going round other stars. But perhaps most importantly, it will look at the infrared spectrum of these planets and their atmospheres, particularly in the band in the infrared between 7 and 17 microns, and it'll be looking for the absorption spectra of carbon dioxide, ozone, and water, looking for signs of biological activity, the signatures of life. Well, I'm sure there's plenty of life up there, and one day we'll find out. John, thank you very much. Don't forget, if you want the latest astronomical information, then dial up our information line, 0891 8030, or CFAX, page 620. And when I come back next month, Ian Nicholson will join me, and we'll talk about our own particular star, the Sun. Good night.